Ladies and gentlemen, just before we start another episode of the Fitness Academy podcast, just a reminder for those who are listening on YouTube that we are now on Spotify. So please head down into the link in the description and check us out there. On with the episode. Keep going. Like that is all I can say is keep going. Like it's been, oh God, eight years since I last competed at the Commonwealth Games. And there was obviously times where I was just like, no, I give up. I don't want to do this. But enjoy it i think that's what's pulled me through it is that i realize i enjoy the sport so i tell anyone just enjoy it um and just keep going like the, you know that breakthrough is around the corner ladies and gentlemen sorry for the interruption again but just remind that we're now looking for podcast episode sponsors so as we're progressing we're just starting to get bigger guests on and the guests are incredible so if you want to advertise your business or you know someone who does want to advertise their business please do get in touch with us the email is always down in the link in the description and we can always sort something out on with the episode Welcome back to another episode of the Fitness Academy podcast. Now, this, ladies and gentlemen, is an amazing one because on paper and in person, this is an unbelievable one to film. I've got the fastest Welsh woman of all time on the podcast today, Hannah Breyer. Now, Han, before I say thank you for coming on, I'm going to hit you straight away. I don't know if you watched Joe's episode, okay, and I'm going to get onto it in a second. I surprised him a bit with a little teaser because obviously we all know he's a big movie star on youtube doing his essentials videos aside from all his running accolades but you know i have to do the same thing okay do it for every guest no matter where they are so being an athlete and um having to train a lot having to eat a decent amount of calories what is your strangest food combination but your favorite one at the same time oh I don't have any strange combinations. Oh, what? Everyone, asks, I know everyone asks me this. Um, uh, oh my gosh, the best thing. Oh, it's not even strange, but my friends don't like it. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just the simple, like peanut butter and banana. But everyone thinks that is really quite odd. That's, um, that's quite, I like it. That's quite funny. I was going to say because I am always, if I need a snack, it's always rice cracker, peanut butter, yeah. sliced bananas on top. You can't. That's not it. strange. That's not strange. It's, it's not test- strange, is it? My friends just don't like it. They think it's just odd, but I think it's nice. I think you got to leave them. I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so, again, ladies and gents, this is amazing for me to film because, again, no offence to anyone and there is no particular order, but this feels like I've completed the sticker album of the Briar family in terms of the running section, okay? So I've had both on now, which is unbelievable, and I, they're both unbelievable, and I haven't, I haven't even finished the second one yet. So, now, on to some accolades. So, Fastest woman of all time. It's all right. She's she's done. She's done. A Welsh national hundred meter record holder. Ran in the Commonwealth Games 2014 at 16 years old in Glasgow, and then obviously very recently was it about a week and a bit ago ran in Birmingham 2022. And I left the best one for last because I actually didn't remind us. I wanted to wait until we actually had the call. So Hannah did her BSc in Loughborough Uni. She's done her masters in Cardiff Met. I've done my BSc at Cardiff Met, and I'm going to do my MSc in Loughborough Uni. So, <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's actually backwards. So, it's unbelievable. So, we started well. We started well. Hannah, thank you so much for coming on. It's okay. Thank you for having me. <laughs> no worries at all. So, we've got all of that stuff out of the way now. We've got all that stuff out of the way, the brilliant stuff. Now, talk to us about your journey. So, obviously, We've got a little bit of an idea from obviously having Joe on the podcast, but can you tell us a bit about your journey starting off with the Swansea Harriers or starting off in knee? Give us a bit, give us a rundown. Yeah. um, Well, I was always a really active child. Like I did everything, um, any sport you could think of. I was, I'd throw myself into it and I was so competitive. Like I had to win everything. Um, (laughs) And I'm still like that. (laughs) I'm still a stupidly competitive person. Um, But yeah, it was sports day and, um, I was quite quick. My teachers were all like, okay, she's all right. She's beating some of the guys, like, you know. Um, and, yeah, they basically told my mum to take me down to Swansea Harriers. And I tried everything there. Like, they always say don't sort of specialise really early. I was about eight, nine years old. Tried all the events. Um, 
and I'm quite small, so I was never very good at like the high jump or any of the okay. sort of jumping events. And I'm not very big um, or very strong, so I wasn't very good at any of the throws or anything like that. So um, yeah, it was sprinting. I just fell into it really, um, and it just progressed really quickly. Like I think I won my first Welsh title, um, junior title, when I was 11, out of nowhere. Um, and then yeah, I just started going through the age groups, um, broke majority of the Welsh records on the way through and then landed myself at Commonwealth Games when I was 16 years old. And that's basically the turning point, I think. Before that, it wasn't very serious. Um, got to 16, and then I thought, actually, you know, having chats with people, I better take this seriously. Like, I'm all right. <laughs> I was going <laughs> to say, yeah, she's all right. She's all right, yeah. She can run a bit. She can she can, she can, can put one foot in front of the other really quickly. She's all right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it was like, it was a bit odd because I was doing my GCSEs, and that was very much, like, the priority. Um I didn't even think about the Commonwealth Games. Like I was so sort of just get through my exams. Yeah. Um, and then I remember going to trials and I don't know what happened. Something took over me and I ended up qualifying for the Games um, and got selected. So, um, yeah, that's very short but sweet journey. But, um, yeah, it's been great. <laughs> and then what about going on to Loughborough before I, before I dissect it all and break it down um, like a little detective? How sort of <laughs> what, what – so, again, for myself personally – and I don't know if you know it, so I don't expect you to. Uh, Jesus Christ. Um, so three. I've tried to get into Loughborough three times. Now on the third time, I've been successful, thankfully. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. Um, <laughs> was it always going to a uni? And I and I think my mum would kill me if I said I went to Cardiff Met just for cricket because she could have said you could have gone somewhere else. Um, did you sort of go for Loughborough or did you go for a specific uni because of sort of the accolades it's got? Because both Cardiff Met and Loughborough did just for having sort of alumni or athletes which are based there. Obviously, Joe, a couple of others obviously have been to Olympic Games as well. Obviously, Harrison Walsh, I think it is, the discus uh, thrower who obviously won bronze last week. What was it always sort of a sporting uni for you moving on to Loughborough and then on to Cardiff Met? Yeah, that was a really difficult decision for me. I remember sitting down at like, what was it, 17, 18 and thinking, oh, actually, what do I want to do? Um, and there was a lot of different opinions. And I remember being quite overwhelmed by it because I took my education super, super seriously. Like I, that was what came first for me was getting good grades and getting into uni. Um, but then I was also doing really well in athletics. So I was a bit like, right, how do I combine both of them in the most effective way? Um, and I spoke to a lot of people. And I'm very much a home bird. Like I am sort of the typical Welsh girl, sort of stays in Wales, doesn't, okay. you know, <laughs> loves it. Um, and that was a really difficult decision. But I thought Loughborough's got that sort of academic. It's got that something, standard. hasn't it? It's got yeah. a bit of this, bit of that, that like draws you in, doesn't it? Exactly. And I'd have thought sort of what if, um, and I needed to take that, mm. you know, sort of that jump and trial just being in a different country, trial, um, you know, a different coach and, be you know having the best of both academics mm. and sport as well um and I think that's what made me do that decision but it was such a big tie up between Cardiff Met and Loughborough like, I don't think people really realized how mm. close it was okay um up until the very last day and oh then I had word. to sort of accept decline one of them but um yeah that's what sort of drove my decision was sort of thinking right what if like I need to trial this while I can mum and dad on the ropes being like can I make a decision for the love of my mother's life make a decision please <laughs> literally honestly you wouldn't believe the stress that I put my parents through that day because I was there and I'm the most indecisive person ever as well like anyone who knows me will know Hannah can't make a decision <sighs> to save her life so um, it wasn't great but um yeah I'm glad I did it because <laughs> so I've had the best of both worlds now of course and then and then for you because obviously you've mentioned how difficult it was was it always a case of always going to come back to Cardiff Met for Masters once you had finished? Or were you still considering love before MSC being the indecisive person you are, that you've exposed yourself now to the entirety of our audience? <laughs> uh, yes, I was very indecisive. Shock? <laughs> so I actually, at shock, I know, shock, not like me. Um, but yeah, I actually applied for a Masters at Cardiff Met and a Masters at Loughborough. And then lo and behold, we went into lockdown. And I came back to Cardiff to isolate with my family um, and I had to make a decision there. And I made that decision purely off happiness. Okay. Um, I wasn't as happy as I could be up in Loughborough. And I think that was affecting my sort of sporting performance and everything in that sense. So I made a decision and came back to Cardiff. And uh, do you know what? It's probably one of the best decisions I've made. 
<laughs> Whoa. Wow. Actually, ladies and gents, now I haven't actually mentioned this and I should have. This is my bad. So talking about this, because that's very interesting. And you do, you or you did, sports psychology. Am I right? Correct. And yeah. it's very interesting <laughs> that you mention not being happy because I think a lot of people and a lot of athletes will see, you see them in a race, you see the 100 meters, you see the 200 meters, which is obviously the events that Anne competes in, obviously whatever event that they're doing, but they don't see the hours, hours and hours that are put in on the track, on, in the gym, on the gym, in the gym, um, recovering and obviously other sacrifices that we'll mention in a second. How difficult obviously at the same time was it to understand that or sort of make the decision that I got to do this for me and I got to go back home for me because and I think it speaks a lot about yourself that you've actually left the place like Loughborough to not not saying that Cardiff Met obviously is is sort of underneath that in any sense of the imagination but how difficult was it to say look I got to do this for me now rather than thinking about what Loughborough can offer me yeah it was horrendously difficult um because I had so many memories, so many like good, good things up in Loughborough as well. Um, but something didn't click, and I think as athletes, we, we're very self-conscious of sort of how we're feeling and what's going on in our lives. Um, and people don't see that athletes are people as well. And for me, being close to family, close to my friends, like that was what was most important for me. Um, and at the time, I was really struggling with athletics and performance. And it was just not ideal with me being away mm. from everyone. Um, you know, I was struggling like injury wise, um, mental health wise. Like I just needed to come back for me. And I think that's a big decision. Like it was, it was really quite difficult. Um, but once I'd made that decision, I knew it was right. Um, and then from then on, it's sort of everything just started getting drastically better. Like it was just a, a bit of a crazy relief, if anything. Did you? Was there any worry as in coming back then or did you obviously know that you were coming back home so it made that a little bit easier because I think like you said there's a sense well well yeah I'm leaving and I need to do this for me but then at the same time is going to go back sort of and then the same things happen again going to happen because again and, and, and obviously we're thankful that it has sort of gone the right way but for you was it always worries leaving Lethbridge as well as sort of coming back home or sort of vice versa? Yeah, I guess so, because I was in Loughborough for four years, so that became a big part of my life. Mm. Um, I was in the same, you know, with the same training group, um, under the same coaches, so it was, it's a big change, and um, yeah, that's always going to be scary. Any change is always going to be scary, um, and there was obviously a worry that me coming back, I was thinking, right, that I could be doing this, and this could make no change whatsoever, um, but I just had to do it. Mm. It was one of them things that I sort of sat down with my parents, and we just went, right, we need some big changes here. What do I want to do? And I knew I wanted to do psychology. I knew that was a master's I wanted to do. Um, I knew I needed to be closer to friends and family. And it just made complete sense when you put everything on paper. But it was definitely scary because, like, love for being such a big part of my life mm. for four years. And I'd made that big decision when I was 17, 18 years old. Um, so, yeah, it was scary. And it was even more scary as well because I'd given myself um, a deadline because that's how bad I'd didn't really want to do athletics is that I, I gave myself a deadline of if I don't make the Commonwealth Games I'm quitting the sport okay so this was very much a be all and end all sort of decision yeah. <laughs> so that was even scarier but luckily it went very well it's gone all right <laughs> so, it's gone all right thankfully and yeah and what about like you mentioned that that sort of deadline sort of possibly before the first Commonwealth Games let's talk about the first Commonwealth Games and I'm going to straight in jump straight into it because I think it probably it's it's probably not wrong to say that it was a massive thing for such a young person to go to the Commonwealth Games. I mean, any sort of experience that you can get, and I value experience over a lot of things. You know, obviously you need education, you need sort of uh, the right sort of advice from friends and family and things like that. But experience for me is at, at top of that list. Mm -hmm. So for you, did it help you settle into to life on the senior circuit in in a certain way because obviously racing against possibly individuals who sort of were already racing in the olympic games was mm -hmm. that sort of like okay right cool this is a really good experience for me yeah i mean it's such it's it's such an odd sort of way of putting it but it sort of helped me but it didn't at the same time okay. because i was i felt like i was almost thrown into a senior scene where i wasn't mentally prepared for that at okay. all you know I was not expecting to go I was that young that 
I didn't really want to go because I knew I was missing out on a junior international. Okay. <laughs> and when I tell people this, they're like, oh my gosh, you didn't want to go to a Commonwealth Games. And I was just thinking, I was 16 years old. Like, I didn't know what a Commonwealth Games was. Yeah. Uh, but it did prepare me. Like, I, it gave me the motivation and the drive and everything because I saw what these athletes were doing and I wanted part of it. And it really opened my eyes to like how much I love this sport and how special it is, but also how much hard work it takes to get to the top. Um, and that's something that I completely look back on now. Um, and it just taught me so many more lessons. Like going into this Commonwealth Games, um, I just sort of knew what was going on. Yeah. Um, whereas when I was 16, You'd I had been there and done that. You had been there and been done, done that. Yeah. Yeah, but it was just scary. Yeah. Like, 16 years old, and I'd never been to watch a major athletics competition in my life. So the first time I'd been to watch was when I was actually competing in, in it myself. And that was daunting, but I loved every second of it. And it was, you know, it did set me up for the future in terms of experiences and seeing how other people do it. Um, but obviously, at the same time, it was a, it's a very scary world. <laughs> yeah. What 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 was your what your goals? Because obviously you you answered my question and I already had it written down. How rude! Uh, no I'm joking. Um, so what for you? What was your targets? Because obviously f for you not having and it sounds weird, but not having the pressure of understanding what was going on to a certain extent. Did you almost sort of have a goal sort of without sort of before you had even the pistol had gone off? Yeah. So when um, originally when I was sixteen, I got selected for the relay um, and that was what so I qualified for the 200 meters um, but got selected for relay because there was certain timetabling issues um, so I got put in the relay and that was really like a, a big thing because I thought this is a bit better because I'm with a team um, and then I got added to the 100 meters okay. and that was scary um, I remember sitting down with my coach and we didn't really set any goals for that we sort of said we'll get the 100 meters over and done with as terms of just experiencing it see what the cloud the crowd is like um and just being in that environment and enjoying it more than anything i can't say i enjoyed it that much because i was scared stiff like i felt physically sick on that start line um but it was a good experience and then the relay we had goals of making the final mm. and we did that so that was that was brilliant awesome and then like you said it kind of pushed you to sort of be like right this is what i want to do and mm -hmm. this is where i want to be how sort of what was the process then after those games those first games to be like right let's understand what's going on here because like i said you putting your studies first going to university and then sort of carrying on your athletics career to a certain extent what were some of the sacrifices that you had to make leading up to that because for me again like joe mentioned it perfectly well sort of certain things that you got to do which may seem to certain people that you may seem like a boring person or you may seem like an absolute slouch for not being wanted to do things. What are some of the sacrifices that you got to make as a student athlete and then as an athlete in general? Because a student athlete is sort of difficult as enough. But then obviously mm -hmm. having to understand that when you get to a certain stage, you've got to sort of earn a living, but you, you're a full time athlete at the same time. Yeah, it's, it's difficult. I remember going to university and... Um, obviously being a student athlete like it sounds cool um, yeah. but there's so many sacrifices like I was put into a student athlete accommodation block where we had like curfews and no noise okay. and yeah it was it was a bit extreme um, and like I wasn't able to go out and enjoy my friends that much because I had training the next day and that was a complete choice of mine like I knew what it took um, you know like st a student's like meals and everything like that I was having to eat extremely healthy um, and yeah, it was it's sacrifices like that that people don't realise um, until you start doing well, and then everyone's like, actually, like fair play to you, like then now it's paying off. Um, but it's also like you mentioned, like now, for instance, I'm not a student athlete now because um, I've graduated, but you know, it's trying to juggle work and training as well. Um, I think that's what I've grown up to realise is really, really hard. Um, it's trying to balance everything else, but it all pays off. Like it was moments when I was standing on the start line at this Commonwealth Games in Birmingham that I realised all those hours, all those sort of juggling work, running from work, running to training, like, you know, eating healthy, turning down plans with friends, um, you know, missing a big events because I have training or saying no to things. Like it's, it's all worth it. And it was so lovely to be able to show my friends and family that that's what I've been working towards um 
And yeah, it was. It's times like that you realise actually these sacrifices, they're okay <laughs> as much as they are horrendous at the time. It's okay. <laughs> I think it's difficult to like envision, isn't it? Because like you're you're doing all, early mornings. It's pretty cold. You're mm-hmm. in the gym again. You're absolutely knackered. You're 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 doing yeah. things that sort of a lot of people won't understand. Mm-hmm. Is it like sometimes difficult to envisage yourself on that start line, or can you always see yourself? crossing that line with either the time that you want or potentially even winning the race. Ladies and gentlemen, sorry for the interruption again, but just remind that we're now looking for podcast episode sponsors. So as we are progressing, we're starting to get bigger guests on and the guests are incredible. So if you want to advertise your business or you know someone who does want to advertise their business, please do get in touch with us. The email is always down in the link in the description and we can always sort something out. On with the episode. So, so I'm quite lucky that I'm quite a motivation person. So I write down at the start of winter training like where I want to be and my performance goals for like the next year or so um and that's something that I really look back on because I I find that really really helpful in terms of sort of like keeping on track and getting up those days I don't want to go training and all of that so I I definitely write everything down and then look back on it um and then I can envision myself sort of crossing the line and winning races if that's that's how it goes (laughs) And then how quickly are you, like, do you change those goals, like, based on an outcome of one particular race? Because obviously a season is very, very long. So how do you Mm -hmm. adapt those based on a certain race, whether you're running quicker, you're probably having a bit of an injury or or what may have you. How do you adapt those goals? Yeah, I mean, I adapted my goals quite a lot this year, Um, just purely because I'd actually run the times that I'd wanted to run, which was brilliant. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's got to be flexible. Like I, I write them down, but they've always got to be flexible. Um, it's more of a motivation thing for me to do. Like we, we sit down sometimes and we um, sort of alter the goals depending on how training's going, or if I picked up any niggles or um, how the season's going. But yeah, it's, it's really flexible. Like it's, it's not set in stone. And, and sort of, is that something that you've always had or has it taken you a long time to sort of develop the open-mindedness in that sense? Yeah, it's definitely taken a long time. I've struggled with a lot of injuries um, throughout my time. And it's, yeah, it's it's been difficult to say the least, I think. Um, When things don't go to plan with an athlete, you sort of, like, I'm such a perfectionist. If something doesn't go to plan, then I I really quite struggle with it. Um, And that's taken a lot of time for me to sort of change goals and realise, you know, like, if things don't plan, if plan A doesn't go to plan, then, you know, we've always got plan B, we've always got plan C. Um, So that's definitely taken a lot of time. (laughs) And how, and sort of, you, you mentioned plan A, plan B, plan C, but how does, how do you deal with the setback when it initially happens, whether it's like an injury, a poor race or things like that? Because I think Joe mentioned it again quite well. Like you, you almost have to like, almost like put out your mind. You're always going to have one bad race. You're always going to have sort of a bad heat or a bad, sort of a bad time at some stage. How do you prepare yourself for when sort of that happens? Obviously you don't want it to happen and you prepare not to happen, mm-hmm. but things like this happen, don't they? Yeah, exactly. I think... What's worked for me is sort of putting everything into perspective. Like, even if you have a bad race or you have a bad injury, like, you're still a decent person. You know, people will still love you. People will still think of you the same way. Like, you know, I think I've had so many years of my performances being tied up in the way that I think of myself that it becomes a really, really bad relationship. Um, So I take a step back. If something doesn't go to plan, I take a step back and think, Hannah, this is just sport. Things happen, you know, it's not the end of the world. You are still going to wake up tomorrow and everyone's still going to love you and you're still going to work your hard, like, you know, you're still going to work your hardest and you'll be fine by next week. And then 99% of the time, everything goes to plan the week after. Um, it's just one of them things and it's just sport. And that's the way I sort of like to look at it. Well, again, like, I similar to like, the last question, were you always sort of like that or did it take you a bit of time to sit down, develop that? Or did you always, sort of, did you take it to heart a lot? Did you always think... Or maybe even overanalyze. That's a big thing which I used to do, or maybe still do sometimes, is overanalyze things to like the, the minutest detail. Is that something you developed yeah. sort of as you've gone on and as you've got more experienced? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's something I really struggled with when I was younger. I think um, was sort of overanalyzing absolutely everything. Um, why didn't this go to plan? What what could I have done better? Where sometimes these things just happen. And for me, I think I've learned a lot from. Um, my master's course at Cardiff Met because I obviously did sports psychology and there was a lot of aspects in there that I sort of 
realized I was like actually this is this is really describing me um, and it was sometimes it wasn't it wasn't a good thing um and I learned so much from that that I I don't actually think I'd have performed that well this year if it wasn't for the fact I did that course um and yeah it was just I think it was just a process and it was yeah really really beneficial so you've used it almost by you've used both in tandem with each other you've used a run for your course and you've used your course for your running yeah I think so it's quite it's quite odd when you actually think about it um but yeah, yeah it's definitely helped me like and even just having something else to focus on because if you just do sport full-time it's really really mm-hmm. difficult like it's, it's it's hard to separate you know your life from sport um so for me doing a master's and focusing on education was actually really beneficial in that sense is that a way which is that a way that you almost switched off or do you have like other ways where you sort of almost switched off in sort of outside of both education and running because obviously you, you turn yourself in the deep end and you, you've done sports psychology and you you run so it's sport 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 is a how do you like almost switch off from from both of those yeah there's a, there's a lot of things like i love reading um I read so many books, it's actually embarrassing. Um, but like, I think my parents are getting so fed up of me just bringing books home and putting them on the bed upstairs. But um, yeah, I love to read. Um, I just, I, I think I just separate myself from it completely. Like I'll just watch stupid stuff on TV, just anything that's not sport, or I'll go out for a walk or I'll meet up with some friends um, and just talk about anything but sport. So I try to, on my days off, like, you know, when I have Saturdays off training, that is like, Hannah does not speak about sport. Yeah. Hannah doesn't do any sport. Like it's, it's that's my day of just let's be a semi-normal person. <laughs> it's and that's difficult, isn't it? Because you have all your friends and family, and they want to know what it was like. Obviously, they watch you on TV, and I managed to catch you in a couple of the heats, which were brilliant. And you, you, you're almost like, how was it? And you're like, it was all right. Yeah, it was brilliant. Yeah. yeah. And you're like, I'm trying to switch off here. Like, do you mind? Not in obviously a rude way, but like you're trying to switch off and you're trying to have a bit of time off, but everyone wants to know. It's difficult, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, it's so difficult. Yeah. It's so, so difficult. And I think my parents have got it down to a T now. Like they know, don't talk about the race unless they've I bring had it two up. Tra- they've, had, they've learned it from two different people. So oh, they've got it down God. to a T surely. Oh, they have. Yeah, they have. <laughs> So it's, it's quite interesting because they just know, like, if, if they don't bring up the race, we don't bring it up, end of. Like, okay. or they won't ask about how it's training because if we don't bring it up, then we don't want to talk about it. So it's it's, it's really quite interesting. Um, okay. But, yeah, I think my family, with having me and Joe, like, they've they, they've, they've understood. <laughs> That's brilliant. So talk, talking of take, talking of the wee man, so um, having a brother who obviously does a very, very similar, obviously he does the, uh, the 400 metres, it's a little bit different in certain aspects, but then obviously having a brother who runs as well. Has that come with more, and this sounds incredibly bizarre, but has it come with more sort of sort of advantages in the fact that you've always got someone there for advice? Or mm-hmm. has that put, a little, and this is going to be a bizarre question, has it put a bit of added pressure, seeing as mm-hmm. sort of you both have grown up very, very close to each other and you know sort of that, you both sort of almost succeeded at the same time, which is brilliant to see. So is it is it obviously advantageous or is it sort of, do you have those added pressures? Yeah, I guess there's always those added pressures. Like, But I think we view it in the way of, well, if Joe can do it, I can do it. Or he's like, well, if Hannah can do it, so can I. Like, we, we, we don't really have those pressures. Like, we always want each other to do really well. Like, that's, that's what I think people find quite odd is that we're always that supportive of each other. Like, if one makes a team but the other one doesn't, like, it's not the end of the world. Like, you know, I still absolutely want him to go out there and smash it. Like, it's, you know, it's brilliant. Um, and in terms of, like, advantages, like, we, we always chat to each other about sort of advice and what we think we should be doing. Like, it's, it's one of them things. Like, even when I was deciding to come back to Lu- from Loughborough to Cardiff, I asked Joe, and Joe was like, I think you need to come back um, and, you know, have a look at options down here. Um, so it's always nice having someone who really understands, like having someone who trains, you know, I train with Joe um, and understands, like, the pressures of it all and understands, like, what needs to be done to be successful. Like, And we hold each other accountable for it as well, which is, is good. Like, I think it's, it is a really good thing. And and obviously we talk about the professional stuff that you guys, but obviously the 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 random chats, how disgusting a certain set was, how difficult a certain session was, how much you want to quit, how much you don't want to run anymore, those yeah. those happen definitely. I'm sure of oh, it. Hundred percent. <laughs> awesome. So 
So, so moving on to the last couple of points here. Um, for yourself, has there been, and you've mentioned you've had a number of coaches, and I'm going to make this interesting because obviously we know Joe's been an influence that you just mentioned, and your mum and dad, how influential they've been. But has there been anyone else who has sort of either influenced you or sort of helped you along the way in in a very, very impactful way where, where it's stuck up until this day? Or a number of people? Doesn't have to be one. Yeah, I think I think there's a number of people. Like, I think my first coach, um, Neil Merry, he definitely helped me along the way. Like, I think he was definitely influential in making me realise that actually I can compete with these girls. Because um, he was my coach that took me through to the first Commonwealth Games before I moved to Loughborough. And um, I think he was one of the ones who really made me believe, like, actually, like, you are good enough to be in races with these girls. Because um, beforehand, I felt like such a sort of imposter in that environment where I thought I don't deserve to be here like I'm just here because I'm lucky whereas he actually sort of helped me get that far um and there's been so many people along the way like you know just giving me advice and it's quite it's quite hard to pinpoint like a few people but it's, it's yeah it's, it's been a been a team effort <laughs> <laughs> for sure team Bray all the way um <laughs> what um and that one point just before we move on to the final one because it's just sort of I've just thought of it now how mm-hmm. how so how long did it take you along your career up until today to kind of again have a bit of confidence in yourself and i don't think you would mind me saying how like when, when you're mentioning oh i don't deserve to be here and mm-hmm. and i've got here by luck it, it's it's putting yourself down where because you've gone on to achieve some unbelievable things um so how how sort of how long did it take you to kind of finally sort of stop sort of being so sort, sort of negative self-talk if you like see a little bit of psychology there as well uh, <laughs> how long did it take to sort of kind of push out that negative self-talk and kind of push in today or does it still sort of come about today do you know what it's only taken until this year that i've actually st- like felt completely and utterly confident in my ability um and that's crazy like i've been doing this sport since i was eight nine years old and i'm now 24 like so i think it's only taken this year um and obviously like doubts come back like there's been a few times this year where i've been like oh can i actually do this you know when you're lining up on the start line of a final and you're the favorite to win and the commentators shouting like you know oh hannah Breyer, like she should be you know running away with this like and there's been a few occasions i stood in the start line going please don't say that please don't say that like you know but obviously that kind of creeps in but it's only this year that i've actually gone actually like i can i can do really well here like this is the first year that that's, that's actually happened for me so it's, it's taken a while like it's a is, long while it doesn't happen overnight does it rome wasn't built in a day so exactly. and and sort of and sort of again just before we push on to the last bit where the finishing one i keep saying that about 50 times i keep coming up with new bits so of what's um what's next for you then obviously we understand you're having a bit of well-deserved time off yes ladies and gents she's a human being she can have a bit of time off if she wants to um what's next for hannah Bray? what's next so i've got a few weeks off um, and then we're going to go back into winter training, um, back and do some grim sessions. Oh, and... odd miles. Yeah, I know. I hate this time of Sorry year Sorry if I've so just much. ruined it for you, by the way, in case you're excited about your <laughs> Mac. <laughs> I was more excited about it. <laughs> um, but yeah, we'll go back to that and then hopefully make some uh, teams next year. I've got some big plans for next year. Um, and based off the back of this year, I think it's achievable. So I'm awesome. excited for and that. And we're definitely looking forward to seeing those achieved. No pressure. Um, so again, just finishing it off, and this is an important one because again, through through a lot of struggles and and a lot of messages, so Hannah's only the second female that we've had on the podcast, and that's why I was so excited for this interview. Uh, interview this for this podcast, not an interview. So it's definitely way too informal for an interview. Um, <laughs> so, of what do you have one piece of advice for anyone who wants to be? The next Hannah Breyer, the next fastest person in a country, or the next champ. Talk to us. Keep going. Like, that is all I can say is keep going. Like, it's been, oh, God, eight years since I last competed at the Commonwealth Games. And there was obviously times where I was just like, nah, I give up. I don't want to do this. But enjoy it. I think that's what's pulled me through it, is that I realised I enjoy the sport. So I tell anyone, just enjoy it. Um, and just keep going. Like, the, you know, that breakthrough is around the corner. It, it always is um so yeah enjoy it and keep going that's what i tell others <laughs> the amount of individuals and you'd be surprised by that who have just said love the sport and yeah. if you don't love it it's probably time to sort of take a break or yeah. step away so 100%. what a 
what a way to finish, ladies and gents. This has been absolutely unbelievable. It's been about 40 minutes now and it's felt like five. So um, <laughs> thanks, Hannah, so much for coming on the, the podcast. The fastest woman in Welsh history. So uh, thank you so much for coming on, Hannah. It's okay. Thank you for having me. No worries at all. And obviously check obviously all of Hannah's links in the description. And then obviously we're rooting for her until she comes back to, to racing season. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you for listening, team, to another episode of the Physics Academy podcast. That was an unbelievable episode, and I say it every single time. But um, the the way that that episode with Hannah flowed was unbelievable. And I think it's a credit to her, sort of how so how hard she's worked and obviously the sacrifices that she's put in. Um, throughout the time and obviously have led to amazing achievements like participating in the Commonwealth Games being the fastest Welsh woman of all time what an unbelievable title to have so um, thank you very much Hannah if you are listening and thank you very much again team for listening to another episode of the Fitz Academy podcast please check all of Hannah's links down in the description box below and I will see you guys for another episode of the Fitz Academy podcast next Sunday at 6pm take care guys Don't